So, anybody know what day it is? Sunday. Yes, it's Sunday. Come on, guys. I heard a whisper back there. Today's Christ the King Sunday. You all had that marked on your calendar, right? And you knew this day was coming and what it was about, right? No? That's okay. Thank you, Nana, for being honest. I appreciate that. We talked about it at Sunday school, so she knows. Like, she's, she's in with the no. Okay, so today, today is Christ the King Sunday, or also known as uh, Reign of Christ Sunday. It's a holy day. Not just because it's Sunday, but supposedly it's a special day or something. Nobody knows. Cool. Well, well, by the end of the service, you'll know, okay? We'll, we'll know, and you'll be able to tell people, hey, it's Christ the King Sunday, yeah. We'll get there together, I promise. So, first off, here are some fun facts about Christ the King Sunday. Um, first, it's a relatively new holy day to the church, considering the church started thousands of years ago. Uh, this holy day was instituted in 1925 by this classy looking dude. His name is Pope Pius XI, um, and he uh, instituted this holy day after World War I, um, and this tension inside of him and this conviction that we need to fight off both secularism and nationalism, which when you think about World War I, like, it makes sense that this holy day would try to combat that with some of the tensions and rising in the different, um, uh, the tension in, the, in World War I that would eventually lead to World War II and Nazis and um, fascism and all of those things developing even more. So he believed that this holy day needed to be instituted, specifically a feast day. It's an excuse to eat, guys. Yeah. It's supposed to be a, a positive holy day to celebrate Christ the King, to remember who reigns on high and where our loyalties lie. Now, so this was this holy day was established in 1925, but in 1970, um, a different pope moved it, its holy day, to the end of the church calendar, so that it would be the final day in um, in the church calendar to celebrate um, the end of the year. So basically, we're like on New Year's Eve, in case I didn't know, but church style. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we're excited. I got my sparkly stole out to celebrate. Like, it's a big day. This is a, a special day reminding us who reigns on high and who our hope is in. Especially thinking about the history of when this was established. It's to combat the confusions about earthly rulers versus our, the internal heavenly ruler and making sure we make distinctions there on who to worship and who to put our loyalties towards. The fun part is there's lots of beautiful paintings that exist to celebrate this. Oh, hey, here's a list of, sorry, Heather, I apologize. Hey, advance, and you can do it again. Here's one fun painting. Um, some angels giving Jesus his crown, and he's got the whole world. <laughs> Thank you for the few that humored me. Um, and then there's these other two here. Um, these are called icons, which in the Greek Orthodox are technically considered writings, not paintings. I don't understand, but that's fine with me. Um, uh, Jesus representing his holy crown, eternal father. So that one is a painting. The other one is actually a mosaic. If you look at it tightly, it's a bunch of little tiny tiles to make that beautiful picture. This is a big deal. There's lots of art about this day. Um, and um, so here we go. We're going to celebrate together. Is that right? We're going we're gonna to celebrate Christ the King? Yeah? Cool. All right. Some people are getting excited. <laughs> it's 
it's fine, it's fine guys. We'll learn to be excited together. So we're journeying through um, the Revised Common Lectionary, this schedule of texts. And for Christ the King Sunday this year, how are we celebrating the King? He's on a cross. What? It's a little confusing. But the beautiful thing about this um, Revised Common Lectionary, or RCL, it goes through the church calendar and tries to teach us as we read. And so over the course of three years, you get the big picture of scripture and the story of Jesus um, doing segments at a time. We are in the last part of that segment. We're in year C, which means it's the last of three years, about to turn over at the very beginning again. So we've got the very final punchline of like, ah, oh, Christ the King, he survives. Um, but the other few years, um, the first year we learn about um, Christ on the throne, uh, which is, this passage is the least of these, Matthew 25, where he says like, what you did to the least of these, you did to me. Um, this idea of a kind of kingdom that's different than what we're used to. Um, not about like self-interest, but about um, a support system of compassion. The second year um, is John 18, and this is um, Jesus on trial, and he's having a conversation with Pilate, and Pilate directly says to him, hey, are you the king? He's like, yeah, you, yeah, I am, but my kingdom's bigger than Rome. It's not of this world. Okay. Um, and then we get to the consequence of that sentence, that statement, um, where Jesus is on the cross. And through these three pieces, we see a bigger picture of who Jesus is as our king. It's going to be great, guys. But we're going to dive into the last part of this story together. We are going to look at Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 43 together and see this picture that is supposed to wrap up the full image of um, the Christ the king and hopefully get a better understanding of what that means for us and why we need to celebrate. Uh, you can advance. Um, so if you want to turn with me to this page um, and read along with me, you're welcome to. Otherwise, the text will be on the screen behind me. Um, the computer has been doing weird things today, so give Heather like a thumbs up. She's doing what she can with what the resources she's got. Like, sorry that it's not cooperating with you, Heather. We love you. Thank you for suffering with the technology that is available. Okay, starting in verse 32. They also led two other criminals to be executed with Jesus. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They drew lots as a way of dividing up his clothing. The people standing around watching, the people were standing around watching, but the leaders were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he really is the Christ, sent from God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came up to, off, to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you really are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above his head was a notice of a formal charge against him. It read, The king, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging next to him insulted Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Responding to the other criminal, Spoke, harsh, spoke harshly to him. Don't you fear God, seeing that you have also been sentenced to die? We are rightly condemned, for we are receiving the appropriate sentence for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. Super cheerful text for a celebration day, right? But perhaps you hear some kingly language happening in this text. Um, a discussion of 
the religious leaders and the Roman soldiers both mocking Jesus saying, um, aren't you like supposed to be special or something? How come you can't save yourself in this boat? Like, prove it. Prove it that you're, you're the special one, the Christ, but, you know, save it yourself. There's this, they hear the language, but they were missing it. And then the conversation of the criminals on the cross, where the first one calls Jesus the Messiah, but then it's like, hey, can you get me off this cross? Like, I really don't actually want to die. Like, can you just save yourself and me? Okay, thanks. And the other criminal's like, what are you doing, dude? Like, uh, this is God here. Like, do you not have any respect? Jesus, please remember me in your kingdom. And then the interesting part about these two in their conversations is they each had something right and they each had something wrong. So frequently we hear the first guy and we just think, yeah, he's a sassy butthead, like, just ignore what he has to say. And the second guy knows what he's talking about and let's just, like, go him, he's figured it out, yay! But when we look back, they each have something wrong and they each say something right. The first guy does acknowledge that Jesus is Christ in his language and is asking for help. But he's thinking physical help, like, get me out of this situation. The second guy claims that Jesus was innocent. Let me unpack that in a second. Um, but also acknowledges that Jesus has a kingdom to come. The reality is, Jesus wasn't innocent. He actually was a convicted criminal being executed for treason. You ever thought about that before? No, because usually in church what we say is, Jesus died on the cross and he's our savior. Woohoo! But there's, that, which is true, okay? But in this moment, the like earthly reality was something different. There's a reason Jesus got hung on the cross. And the reason was that whole conversation with Pilate where he said, yeah, I'm a king, my kingdom's bigger than yours. Jesus probably wasn't that snarky, but, but it's dramatic and fun if I say it like that. Jesus makes a statement about being a king, which is in direct competition with the Roman Empire. Treason. Jesus made these statements against the Roman Empire saying, hey, I'm a ruler. What are you going to do about it? You know what they're going to do about it? They're going to hang him on a cross for that statement. The reality is, though Jesus was not innocent, he was perfect and holy. And there's an interesting division here. That Jesus can be convicted of treason and executed as a criminal, but still be perfect, holy, and good. The difference there is, governments make mistakes, and not all laws actually define what is good, true, and holy. It's easier to see during this time of Jesus where the Roman Empire worshipped their emperor, and Christians were separate from that. It's a little harder to see in a country where we celebrate our freedom to worship and are not persecuted whatsoever for this ability to gather. It's harder to notice that, that tension there. But the reality is true. Sometimes governments make mistakes. A lot of times governments make mistakes. You may be familiar with one or two of those. Jesus was making a big statement about the government and who our loyalties to, should be to. Now in this moment, Jesus seems a little intense um, with his statements. But at the same time, he is also being compassionate in the midst of being executed as a criminal. On the cross, he is saying, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing and it invites them into paradise. Both of the criminals have this conversation with Jesus, and at the end of this whole story, 
Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And for me, I don't know about you, but I've always assumed it was just the last guy he was talking to. But the conversation is pretty open-ended. Like, multiple people have said things to Jesus, and he hasn't responded to anybody until this last moment. And in this last moment, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. I think he, he's trying to make it kind of clear that he gets to decide who comes. The, the clear-cut answer of who got that, that invitation isn't as open as, uh, or isn't as obvious as I have always painted that picture in my head. Because our king is the one in charge, not some governmental figure, and not myself. Thank goodness, because, you know, I just, crosses don't look good on me. <laughs> thank you guys, thank you. <laughs> this heavy thing is happening, and we're on this celebrate, celebratory day, like, woohoo, it's Christ the King Day, he's reigning on high, except he's about to die right now. But at the end of this year, at, you know, we've celebrated this whole year in the church calendar, which starts with Advent next week. I could be a Sunday, by the way. Starts next week. This countdown to a baby being born, which led, leads to a ministry, which leads to a crucifixion and a resurrection and a hope, and then the role of the church, which we just spent months learning about the role of the church. And the fact that we aren't just supposed to sit in pews, but we're supposed to do stuff. I know it sucks, but like, you have a responsibility too. Like half the church year is talking about, hey, your job's happening now. And then at the very end of this whole story, we're pointed back to the fact that Christ is triumphant. Christ will rule over all. That even in the midst of all this waiting that we're in after this long season of the church, at the end of that season, Christ is triumphant and will rule. Rule in ways that we actually will be able to notice and everyone will understand instead of just um, something that's more covert. The completion of the Christian story happens on Christ the King Sunday pointing us back to the hope we have. Though we're in the season of the church, we're waiting for our king. And it helps us to remember as we get ready to transition back into Advent and start the cycle over again of what we're hoping for and what we're waiting for, keeping us grounded in that hope. Woohoo! Like, all right, we're celebrating this hope. That's great. But what in the world does this mean for us in our daily lives? What does this mean as we're interacting with people, as we're living on this earth? What do I do with this Christ is a king information? Well, um, we follow Christ and live by his instructions. In Sunday school today, we had a little bit of interesting conversation about some of the his and Jesus' practical steps he talked about in living in this world, but also worshiping God. And what we ultimately see is that we live in the reality that no government is actually our ruler. Stay with me here. I'm not talking about anarchy. Okay? I'm not talking about it. Okay? We're not talking about anarchy. Okay? We can be followers of Christ and still followers of the law. Okay? Jesus even talked about paying your taxes. Shucks. Because I'd really like to skip out on that. Not officially, if anybody's listening on the internet, like, <laughs> I will pay my taxes. <laughs> but the reality is that no government deserves our loyalty above Christ. First and foremost, 
our loyalty is to him. No laws, bills, or acts of Congress determine for us what is right or wrong. As we see with Jesus, sometimes he breaks the law and he is still good. Once again, we're not talking about anarchy, but we are talking about our loyalty being to God first and foremost. And God defining what is right for us, not the government or the law. That we are faithful to the law until it tells, contradicts what we know to be true about Jesus. We worship a king who was executed by the state for treason. We have a faith today because Christians gathered in secret when Christianity was illegal and kept passing on the tradition of Jesus. Even in our Baptist heritage in America, Christianity was illegal, Baptists were illegal in certain states. Certain states came to the United States, they founded their own place, and then they decided to bring the Church of England with them. And if you didn't show up to the Church of England and pay your taxes, you got thrown in prison. So you had to go to their church to pay taxes, and you couldn't worship at the church of your own convictions. American history. American history, you couldn't even have your freedom to worship the way you wanted until things kept progressing. American Revolution, woo! Thank you guys. <laughs> I know I'm being dorky today, I'm sorry. But this is one of those things that, it's a, it's a heavy topic that needs a little levity every now and then. Our history says that we need to resist when it comes to being faithful and loyal to God above all else. Our hope is in Christ. Therefore, we do not, go to the first one, thank you. We do not hold faith in any government. Let me say that again. Our hope is in Christ. Therefore, we do not hold faith in any government, okay? Not anarchy, okay? I'm not telling you to go to, and I'm not telling you to stop paying your taxes. But this is about our hope and our faith. Our salvation does not come from a government or city or community. Our hope does not come from a country or government. And we don't worship a country or government. I mean, yeah, we know this, but Sometimes, we even talked about Sunday school today, sometimes those lines are kind of blurred for us. Sometimes it feels like to be an American means you have to be a Christian, and vice versa. But, I mean, we see the Romans execute Jesus. There's some kind of division here that should happen so that the, our faith remains true and not influenced by selfish intent, but by Christ. Second, our faith is in Christ, and therefore we do not merge our faith with our government or country. We can be patriots without being Christian nationalists. Let's define those two words first. Okay, so patriot, proud of your country. You celebrate where you're from. Um, proud to be an American would be the theme song of a patriot, right? But a nationalist, first, is someone who takes that pride to a new level of excluding and even hurting others to the detriment of people who don't fit my definition or my country. And then on top of that would be Christian nationalism, which would be my country and my faith together are the supreme thing. And if you don't fit into this bubble, you are damned and should be separated and out of this community. Do we see a difference here? Patriotism makes sense. Pride in where we live, in being able to farm, eat, work, 
and live safely and happily, that's a good thing to be proud of. But worshiping our place of what living merges those two things together and forgets the Christ that, that was executed by the state. Part of Christ the King Sunday is remembering where our loyalties are, first and foremost, to Christ. If you want to, by the way, learn any more about the nuances between patriotism and Christian nationalism and things like that, I have a really great website for you uh, to check out. Uh, the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty um, has um, information on Christians against Christian nationalism. And there's a website there you can check out. You can also just Google this and find this information. But they have more resources and videos and things if you want to dive into understanding that stuff more. Um, but Christ the King Sunday is ultimately about remembering that Christ is the true King. Our loyalties lie with Christ, not with America, or Peru, or Canada, or England, or whatever country you live in. We can be proud of our country without worshiping our country as if it were God. <laughs> we finish off this Christian year reminded of who our hope is in. Governments can fail us. We see that in how Christ was executed for proclaiming truth. Governments can fail us, but that doesn't mean we need to become anarchists. <coughs> Instead, we can be patriots with healthy boundaries that ultimately, and first and foremost, have our grounding in Christ. Our hope is grounded in Christ alone. And though we're about to celebrate the birth of a little innocent baby, and this baby is about to go through some really terrible stuff, like in the midst of all of that waiting for this fulfillment to come, hope isn't lost in the waiting. Our hope is found in Christ. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we ask you to be present with us. We ask you to have your spirit guiding us, to help us have healthy boundaries. We recognize the fine line between pride in our country and worshiping our country, and how that can lead to confusions about our faith and about your value of people. Lord, we pray that on this day we remember Christ is a king above all and that we are grounded in your hope and that affects the way we are good, upstanding citizens and that we are compassionate to others that we interact with no matter what categories they fit into or don't fit into. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your grace on this day. In your name we pray. Amen. To celebrate together, let's join hands and sing. And remember who ties us all together.